before the Lord and, and we'll pray that God would just move in a mighty way. Amen. Hallelujah. Let's let's open with prayer. Lord, we thank you for this evening. Lord, I pray that you would anoint this study. Thank you for the opportunity to be able to come together and worship you in the spirit and the truth. Lord, we see those that are missing this evening. I pray a blessing upon them that you would touch them, mind, body, and soul, that you heal them, Lord. And Lord, I pray that you would move upon us that are here tonight, God. Allow your word to minister to our hearts that we would see who you are tonight. In Jesus' name, we thank you. In Jesus' name, we praise you. Amen and amen. God bless you. You may be seated. I uh, want to remember to announce Sunday, uh, Sunday school at 11. And, uh, and then, of course, worship service 12 o'clock. So keep that in mind. <clears throat> this evening, I've chosen to present to you, It Is Jesus. And uh, we're going to read Revelations chapter 1. It's the entire, the entire chapter. It's only 20 verses. But uh, John's revelation opens up and begins to show us who Jesus is. We need to keep our eyes on Jesus. We uh, need to put on and focus our eyes upon him and then keep them upon him. And once we really see who he is, once we know him as our healer, once we know him as our God, we will find that hope that we're looking for, that truth, that salvation that will set us free. Praise the Lord. So it is Jesus. And let's turn to Revelation chapter 1, verse 1. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him, to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John, who bear record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all things that he saw. Blessed is he that readeth and they that hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written therein for the time is at hand. John to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be unto you and peace from him which is and which was and which is to come and from the seven spirits which are before his throne and from Jesus Christ who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth unto him that loved us and washed us with from his from our sins in his own blood and hath made us kings and priests unto God and his father to him be glory and dominion forever and ever amen behold he cometh with clouds and every eye shall see him and they also which pierced him and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him, even so, amen. And verse 8, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is, which was, and which is to come, the Almighty. I, John, also am your brother and companion in tribulation and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ was on the isle that is called Patmos, for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice as a trumpet saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, and what thou seest write in a book and send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia, unto Ephesus, unto Smyrna, unto Pergamus, unto Thyatira, unto Sardis, unto Philadelphia, and unto Laodicea. And I turned to see the voice that spake with me. And being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. And in the midst of the seven gold, uh, candlesticks was one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot and girt about 
the paps with a golden girdle. His head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire, and his feet like unto fine brass, as if they burned in the furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. And he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead, and he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and death. Write the things which thou hast seen, and the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. The mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand, and the seven golden candlesticks, and the seven stars, are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. Praise the Lord. Some may, may pick up on that quite easily, but sometimes that, that gets a little um, jumbled. So we're going to take some time to go through it and, and just kind of see what the Lord has for us. <clears throat> Statistics in 2018 would report that 6.5 uh, million visited the Grand Canyon. 4 million would go on to visit Yosemite National Park. And then 4.1 million would visit Yellowstone National Park. Many each year will be drawn from their cities, their homes, even nations, to come and get a glimpse of nature's beauty. How many desire to go see? It's, it's, I've seen the Grand I've never been able to go to it. I've lived out there for many years, but we never did get the chance to go see it. But flying over it, pretty awesome seeing it from the airplane. I'd like to go and see it myself in my own eyes. But, but just being able to see nature's beauty and to behold it. We stand in awe of the mountains and the oceans, the canyons, the trees, the waterfalls. Even the animals would seem to quiet the noise of stress. Isn't there something about a peacefulness sitting in the midst of nature and seeing the chipmunks or the squirrels as they scamper about? So much of that stress that takes hold of our lives when we're able to sit in that quiet time seems to fade away. In fact, phrases are heard such as this when we experience such uh, things that nature happens to give to us. And we say, we, we tend to look at the cares of life and they begin to fall away. There seems to be a clarity in our minds, I. Maybe there's a spiritual awareness or a restoration of peace. We begin to find purpose again. There's great inspiration that becomes restored. And a lot of times, I know I've said it a lot myself, you cannot deny that there is, an, there is not a God. You can't deny the existence of an all-creating being. If the glimpses of a creator in what we call nature have such great impact, on our lives. How much more does the revelation of the Creator named Jesus Christ impact us as a per as a person, as a saint, as a as a soul? That the God of all creation would come to this earth, nail our sins to His cross, fill us with His wonderful Spirit. This all brings an, an awakening. And ourselves, and it gives us a hint to tell all that there is hope. How many of you heard that before? Because he lives, I know I can face tomorrow. Amen. Because he's alive, I know I have hope. Hallelujah. Yes. When we get our eyes off of life and even nature, and we put our eyes upon Jesus, oh, how great he becomes in our lives. David would describe God as both terrible and great. Now to someone who may not understand the terminology that this may seem, it may seem a little odd to them 
to think of God in this type of manner terrible. And the New King James Version would use the word awesome instead of terrible. But awesome now is somewhat watered down in our culture. The meaning of it uh, conveys in, in our present world does not even do justice in explaining how awesome God really is. Hallelujah. Let's take, for example, C.S. Lewis's Chronicles of Narnia, the lion, the witch, and the wardrobe. The idea of terrible and awesome God is expressed through this uh, awesome lion, Aslan. Aslan is described as having terrible paws, unchanging eyes, and a deep, soothing voice that casts out all fear. I don't know, has anybody ever seen, seen that or read the books? It's quite interesting. You ought to do it. C.S. Lewis is a good writer. In C.S. Lewis' work of fiction, Aslan is a representation of God. Oftentimes, we think of Jesus as the slain and risen Lamb of God. But let's take a look at John's revelation, and we will here in the next few moments. Jesus Christ is more than a slain Lamb. He is also the conquering lion of Judah. He yes. represents our hope. He gives us the justice we so deserve. To the world consumed by the power of death and the grave, he holds the keys to hell and the grave. Hallelujah. Yes. Praise the Lord. Jesus has conquered death and holds power over all of it. Yes. Why? To benefit us yes. who would bear his name and walk in his spirit. How many enjoy walking in in the spirit of Almighty God. Hallelujah. As we begin to take and open up our text in Revelations chapter 1, uh, John begins to refer to the seven churches as he begins to minister to them. And they have real issues because they are real church, a real church that has great need. It's also a representation of the church. That spans great generations, the generations of time from John until right now. And it will go on into the future until Jesus comes back again. That's what's so awesome about Jesus is that we can preach his gospel now, feel his spirit now. But one day we're going to see him with our own eyes. Hallelujah. It is Jesus. John's introduction was always a greeting of grace. His greeting was to explain or reveal a purpose for his writing. It also would serve as an outline to uh, the contents of the letter that would be explained later throughout his epistle. A greeting of friendship, a greeting of hope, a greeting of love will always land an open ear or an open heart. How would you want someone to greet you? Would you listen to someone that was hastily walking by you? Or would you take time to listen to someone that greeted you with grace? Someone who greeted you with love. Someone who greeted you with open arms. It describes a God that we're serving. Hallelujah. That's the way Christ uh, treated everyone. It's the way he greeted everyone. It's after John's greeting in verse 4 that he begins to state the greeting came from Jesus. This, these words John was saying is, is just the vision that I'm, I'm having. This is, this is God given. This is something I'm able to pin down for you from the one who died for us. John uses a little, little lit, lit, an airy, <laughs> yeah, tactic called circumlocution and I had to I had to go over that word over and over again because I'm the world's worst at trying to pronounce words while I'm trying to give a lesson but anyway the meaning of circumlocution is the use of many words where fewer would just do the job and especially in a deliberate attempt to be vague or evasive and so it's commonly, this type of word is commonly used in the book of Hebrews. So to give an example of circ, uh, circumlocution, 
uh, I'd just like to draw your attention to Matthew's gospel. Remember when Matthew begins to refer to heaven, he refers to it as the kingdom of heaven. Or when uh, Luke's gospel would refer to the same thing, the kingdom of God. Now these are not these two authors aren't re uh, referring to two different destinations or places or different kingdoms. It's the same kingdom. It's the kingdom of God. What is the kingdom of God? It is the kingdom of heaven. In the same manner that these authors would use different phrases to refer to the same kingdom, John also refers to Jesus as he gives his greeting in Revelation chapter 1 verse 4. Let me read it for you. From him which is, which was, and which is to come, and from the seven spirits which are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth. What is he referring to? He's referring to Jesus. Those aren't separate entities. They're not separate persons, but they're all Jesus. It is Jesus. Now, to someone who may not have an understanding of John's use of this uh, circumlocution, the writing may seem to be uh, multiple uh, references, but really he's only referring to one individual. And that is to Jesus Christ as all in all. Now we can see Jesus as John would phrase him as him which is, which was, and which is to come. We know it was he who was prophesied when they would begin to pin the words, then God was manifest in the flesh and he would come again. Those are instances where Christ is just involved. You just know that's who he was talking about. But what was John talking about when he begins to speak of the seven spirits before his throne? Now the seven spirits uh, is also referred into Revelation not only chapter 1 verse 4 but in chapter 3 verse 1 and chapter 4 verse 5 and chapter 5 verse 6. And the phrasing are often interpreted as being associated with the seven spirits that Isaiah would begin to talk about or refer to in Isaiah chapter 11, verse 2. Now the prophet was uh, referring to and speaking upon the roots of Jesse. He was talking about the lineage of Jesus Christ being of the root of Jesse. And so he refers to the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. The spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. Now, if you count those phrases, there's seven of them there, and those are referring to the seven spirits that are before the throne of God. Count them with me. The spirit of the Lord is one, then the spirit of wisdom, the spirit of understanding. Then there's the spirit of counsel, spirit of might, spirit of knowledge, and then fear of the Lord. And fear of the Lord would just simply mean a respect or reverence before God. As John begins to move his thought, though, on, he begins to transition us from Jesus' greeting to the seven churches to a praise that is being given to Jesus as our high priest. You see, not only is Jesus uh, giving the greeting and it, it, it is he which was and is and is to come, but he's also a high priest. Once again, through this form that John begins to use, the circumlocution, he's referring to Jesus as the high priest as he begins to talk about the high priest. And he begins by pointing to the priestly responsibility of atonement. Instead of the blood of the lamb providing atonement for sin, who is he talking about? He's talking about Jesus providing that atonement. It's the blood of Jesus, the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. 
Jesus' blood is perfect. The blood of lambs and goats slain in the Old Testament will not cleanse us clean from the sins of our lives. It won't take our sins away. How many thankful for a blood, the blood of the precious Savior that takes our sins away? After we begin to see Jesus in his priestly actions, uh, as John writes, that uh, we may be made kings and priests unto God and his Father. To him be glory and dominion forever. Amen. John's writing did not mean God and the Father of Jesus Christ are separate persons, but that God has fulfilled the role of Father because the Spirit of God conceived Jesus in Mary. The word Him in Revelation chapter 1 verse 6 is singular. If God, the Father of Jesus, and Jesus Christ were separate persons, then John would have had to say one would need to receive all glory while the other two, you just stand by because there's only one deity. There's only one spirit. There's only one God. Now that we understand John likes to use circumlocution in his descriptions of God, we know that he was claiming that Jesus can rightly be called both God and Father because he fulfills both of these roles. And listen to this. Also, as he fulfills the role of the high priest. So giving all glory and dominion to Jesus Christ is the same as giving all glory and dominion to God. Why? Because he's all in all. He is the Almighty. How many are you thankful that you know who the Almighty is? You've had his name applied to your life. Praise the Lord. The following two verses in Revelation chapter 1, 7 through 8 gives us even more certainty that Jesus, the one who will return in the clouds in the same manner as he left in the book of Acts, and the one who was pierced in John chapter 19, is the same individual or same subject being referred to as our God and Father in Revelation chapter 1 verse 6. It is also Jesus whom John referred to as Lord when he said he is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the ending. Hallelujah. I'm so glad I know the Almighty. Yes. There is a phrase that John uses, the day of the Lord. And many times it's referring to a time when there's significant end time events that are taking place. For John, it meant the starting of his vision. The reason was to give a transition from a greeting and purpose of his res uh, revelation, then to go into his vision given by Christ that he would share with us. The Alpha, the Omega. Do you realize where those come from? Those are the first and last letters of the Greek alphabet. The description of of God being the first and the last. The beginning and the ending is also found in Isaiah's writings. Isaiah used uh, these titles to refer to Jehovah because he only knew the mighty God as Jehovah. John would use them to refer to Jesus. Yet another circumlocution for John so that he is now confessing Jesus is God. The one like unto the Son of Man, John said, found in Revelation chapter 1 and Revelation chapter 14, is a reference to the same one like unto the Son of Man found in Daniel chapter 7 verse 13. This Son of Man is Jesus, and he stands in the midst of the seven lamps uh, stands that symbolizes the seven churches and the seven spirits of God in Revelation chapter 1. The seven uh, number is a representation of completion. So the church and the gift of the Holy Ghost or the Holy Ghost are represented by the lampstands. Daniel's vision also gives us history 
and shows us that the Son of Man coming in the clouds to the Ancient of Days before being given the everlasting dominion over the kingdom. He, he knew him as the Ancient of Days in Daniel's vision. But look at the words as history begins to unfold for John in his vision. He identifies the Son of Man from the same description that Daniel gave for the Ancient of Days through the same types of descriptions. See if you uh, uh, can remember some of those. The snow, he's referring to the snow, rain of the snow, and, and that John will begin to quote. The wool and the fire, the flaming fire. John is letting us know that the Son of Man and the Ancient of Days are the same, one of the same. The Almighty God, in the Old Testament is Jesus Christ manifest in the flesh in the New Testament. John begins to fall at his feet as he begins to realize who he is standing before. At the feet of the Son of Man who is described as being the Ancient of Days, Dan, uh, John begins to tell us in his vision that this is God. Jesus is God. And I fell before him and I worshiped him in his spirit. Hallelujah. You know, we shouldn't fear the Lord as someone that as a taskmaster or a cruel master. That's not the type of fear John was referring to. His fear that, he, uh, that we should uh, give to the Lord is uh, a respect. Because we know who he is. We know him through his creative power. We know uh, him through his power for his love and his grace and his mercy. Because he is holy and we know we are flawed. He chose the cross that we may know him. That we may have a relationship with him through his spirit. We live and breathe in him. As long as we stay in covenant with him, he intends to give us no harm. He's going to cover us. He's going to guide us. We have no reason to fear the Lord. Hallelujah. Jesus' message through John in Revelation chapter 1. I am the Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. It's the same message that Isaiah would begin to write in Isaiah chapter 41 verse 4, 44 and 6. In 48 and 12, that he is the first and the last. He is the Savior. And beside him, there is none. He is the only one, as Isaiah would refer to him. John uses the history of this great prophet and the prophets of old to back up his vision. And John places Jesus as the face of the Old Testament Jehovah. John is also. Uh, consistent with Paul's message to the church. Paul will begin to teach the Colossian church that Jesus is the firstborn from the dead, meaning more uh, who were dead will live again in the future. This teaching also begins to show that, that in, uh, in John's vision is a foreshadow of the end of age, and that's where we're at now. When the faithful called by his name, those who do not uh, need to fear him. There's no reason for us to fear the coming of the Son of Man. That we should not be in fear of the second coming of Christ. Why? We have heard his voice. We have his spirit. There's no fear. The, the only thing that kept, keeps us in check is that there is a heaven to gain and there is a hell to shun. And I want to make sure that I'm listening to the voice of the one. I want to hear his voice. Hallelujah. Amen. We will be born again uh, from the dead into an eternal life, having glorified bodies if we hear that trumpet sound. Hallelujah. You know, from the beginning, we as humans were always intended to be eternal. We were never intended to have short span lives. In fact, as you go through 
uh, from creation into the book of law uh, in, in Genesis there, the lifespans were pretty big, 900 years. It's, it, we was never intended to live short span in lives. It's the soul of a per person now that lives on forever. Our flesh will die, but our soul will live forever. Our flesh will at some point return back to the ground where it was come from. And creation was not intended to experience death. In fact, when we begin to look at Adam and Eve, they never felt the sting of death until their son was murdered. They never realized the true impact of their sin. Oh yes, they realized that they were naked and something was different about their nature and what they seen and what was happening. But they really didn't feel the effects of what sin could do until they felt the sting of death. And that was Abel. Abel died. And they felt that. So that was the first step in realizing, oh, this is a real thing. Could I tell you here today that sin is a real thing? Yes. It affects you. Yes, it, it conquers. It, it will take life. It is in itself death. But we serve a God that said, I come to give you life. A lot of times, those of us in human nature, we get so caught up in living abundantly in this life that we forget that really our hope is in the life to come. Our joy is in the life to come. Our peace is in the promise of the life to come. We get captured in the material parts of this world, caught up in the things that go around us and demoralized by those issues when really we're getting our eyes off of Jesus. And tonight I'm bringing you it is Jesus that we must keep our eyes upon. It is Jesus that we must serve. It is Jesus that we must love. It is Jesus that that we see as the Almighty. He said, I am the first and the last, the beginning and the ending. I am Alpha, Omega. I want you to know who I am. I am He which is and is to come. I am the Almighty. The Almighty that created all living things is taking upon the flesh called Jesus Christ and dying upon a cross, shedding a, a, a blood for you that you can live abundantly above this life. Yes. Now God will choose to bless us through this life and help us, but really my hope isn't in the terra firma of this world. No, my hope is that I keep my eyes upon Jesus. Because what I can gain in this world stays in this world. Yes. I cannot take it with me. Amen. Hallelujah. You know, they didn't see, Adam and Eve didn't see the impact of sin and death's finality. But now they begin to see the serpent's lies. You see, what life teaches us now is that we can tell a difference from a liar and a truth teller. We, we know when we've been transgressed against and we know not to go back to that issue. We know to sidestep that. We learn through experiences. It's the same way with, with God. When we get in the presence of God, we know the buttons to push to get the Spirit of God to move and just take over in our prayer lives, in our lives. It's whether or not we decide to push those buttons. In fact, it's no uh, hidden secret. The Lord would tell you, if you put me first, if you worship me, if you praise me with your whole heart, I'm dancing in heaven. And not only I'm going to allow my spirit to come down and dance with you, I, I want to be in you. If you push and do the things 
that I have chosen you to do to get my attention, then he wants you to know you've got my attention. Hallelujah. I'm thankful that he shows us those realms and those reasons and whys. And if we choose to do that, we, we can be in the presence of the Lord at any time. Hallelujah. After creation and after uh, the casting out of the garden, it would take uh, some time on earth for man to really eventually begin to hear the voice of the creator. He would be speaking, but nobody would be listening. And then if they would listen, they wouldn't obey. Oh, that we would listen and obey the words of our Lord. Hallelujah. Finally, God would begin to speak. And men like Isaiah and Ezekiel and Jeremiah would begin to hear. Men like Moses and Joseph and Abraham would begin to hear. And he would be able to have the words pinned. In fact, Isaiah would begin to write to us as God would begin to dictate him the words. He said, Isaiah, I want you to write, thy dead men shall live. Together with my dead body shall they arise. Awake and sing, ye that dwell in the dust. For thy dew is as the dew of herbs, and the earth shall cast out the dead. Elijah would experience this type of action as God began to show him how resurrections were really happening as the widow's son was brought back to life. Ezekiel would experience the power of God in a mighty vision as the valley of dry bones would come back together and have a great army for revival once again. This would just be a taste of the true power of God. Just a, just a vision of it. And if I could inject here for a moment. The very presence of God. That we feel in this place right now. As his spirit begins to move. And anoint his word right now. Is just a taste. A little bit. Of what the true nature. And the power of God. As he resides on his throne in heaven. It's just a small taste. That Oh, the Bible would begin, his word begin to tell us, taste and see the goodness of God. Taste and see that he truly loves you. It's just a small amount. But when the real resurrection would happen, there would be great change. Everything would begin to change. Some uh, great things would begin to happen. And, and then God would manifest himself in the flesh and begin to hide. And he uh, overcame every obstacle and lived a holy life in a world of hate and sin. Jesus knew no sin, yet he was cursed by the law because he was hung from a tree. He bare the weight of sin. He did not commit. The grave could not hold him. Death could not contain him. No, the one true living God was truly risen again. That's the true power of of resurrection. Amen. You know, we are victorious through Jesus Christ when we begin to enter our lives into a covenant with Christ Jesus. We become his heirs. Not only his heirs of his righteousness and his life, but for the life to come. We can be for him forever in, in the clouds. Hallelujah. Paul would begin to write of our promise like this. Who shall change our vile body? That it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body. It's according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. It was not until God said, hey, I'm going to go down and take care of my creation. And he was able to subdue the temptations and the sin of this life and be able to rise again. That he can conquer the death, hell, and the grave. You want to know why the adversary is so upset with you living a redeemed life? Amen. You really want to know why he wants to drag you from the altar? Why he wants to try to get you out of the blood-covered uh, uh, cross that you're in right now? It's because he was cast out of heaven. Yes. And God never come down to reconcile himself 
to Lucifer. He never, why? Because he knew the heart of his adversary. He knew the, the hatred that Lucifer had. Guess what? He knows our heart. We're a heart of flesh. And sometimes a heart of stone, but he knows our heart. And he says, because I know your heart and I'll love you first, I know you're going to love me back. That's why I'm coming to earth. That's why the adversary hates you so much. God never come back for him, but God come back for you. What makes you so good? What makes you so right? You think you can just jump in the blood? I'm going, could I tell you he can't touch you when you go through the blood? When you're in covenant and you're listening to the word of God and obeying the voice of your Lord. The adversary can't touch you. Oh, maybe in this life he may pain you a little bit. But our hope's not in this life. Our hope is not in the material things of this life and what can affect us here. But my hope is in heaven. Hallelujah. I just live a short time here, but I'm going to be able to live eternity with my Lord and Savior. Hallelujah. There will be a resurrection, just as the body of Christ that does not tarnish nor fade away. Those who finish the race, those who have endured to the end, they have will be one day glorified with glorified bodies and the resurrection of the dead. John would begin to write about it. He would begin to tell us about it. In his book, Revelation is a book about Jesus Christ. It is Jesus. It's the text that tells the church of a time when Jesus is coming to save all humanity. How many of you thankful for a God and for you like that? That loves you in such a way. Hallelujah. Let's stand and see. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Praise the Lord. I pray this has been an encouragement and an upliftment. I pray it's been understandable. Praise the Lord. And I pray that the word of God would move upon your heart as we move throughout this week. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for your work. We thank you for the move of your spirit. We thank you for your anointing. God, I pray that you would go with us, be with us, bring us back together again to worship you in spirit and in truth. We thank you for all things. Allow your hand of protection to be around our hands. Allow your word to go forth. In Jesus' name we pray. God bless you. God go with you. You're dismissed in Jesus' name.